morning, church. Welcome to those of you in the room and those of you joining us online. Why don't you stand, whether you're here in person or worshiping with us on Facebook Live. I invite you to stand as we worship God together this morning. Saturday was silent. Surely it was through. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb. So since when has impossible ever stopped you? This is the sound of dry bones rattling. church with faith my god my god is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to just ask the man who was thrown on the bones of elisha if there's anything that he can't do just ask
what a great way to start our worship together. Brothers and sisters, I just want to give you all a warm welcome to, Co- warm, warm welcome to Covenant this morning. Uh, what a great opportunity it is we have to gather together to worship the Lord God Almighty. Uh, I have just a couple of invitations I want to, to lift up for, for all of us, but before I do, I want to pause and uh, welcome our folks that are worshiping with us online as well. Uh, I hope that you are warm, and I hope that you are safe, and this goes for anyone here. Uh, if anyone needs some assistance in preparing for the weather that is ahead, uh, please let us know. You can find me after worship or Pastor Zach. Uh, if you're online, you could post in the chat just to have uh, Robin reach out. We would love to uh, walk alongside you in this. We want to be sure everybody is safe and warm and cared for uh, with uh, the weather that we have coming in. Also, I uh, want to give just an a, a invitation. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. I know it's hard to believe uh, that Lent is already upon us. Our plan today is to have 7 p.m. Ash Wednesday worship here in this space. Uh, we will let you know if any changes need to be made based upon the weather. Uh, also, if you are not able or comfortable uh, being in corporate worship, we will have imposition of ashes at noon, from noon to one, uh, come and go as you please uh, on the front porch of the church. So if you would like to come, uh, Pastor Dario and myself will be out there at noon on Wednesday, again, barring any changes uh, because of the weather. Uh, We also want to just save the date out there for those of you that have been around the, the Methodist Church for a while or Covenant. We have our annual charge conference, which is like kind of a state of the church annual meeting. We nominate leaders for the church. We also approve budgets. Uh, That's March the 7th. It'll be at 2 o'clock here, uh, and uh, look forward to having uh, you all present. Uh, We also will be sending members out a link to a Zoom, so if you would like to Zoom in for that, uh, you could be present uh, in that way as well. Our district superintendent, Jeff Olive, will be here presiding there. Last thing, uh, we announced Sunday Drive last week uh, for our teachers uh, that have run out of supplies, hand uh, not hand sanitizer, uh, wipes, uh, paper towels, and children's size face masks. So uh, you could Amazon them to us using the link at Covenant Connects Life, or you can bring them up here by next Sunday. We're putting them together in some uh, some packets uh, for packages for the teachers, and they'll be sent out into the schools the following week. Uh, This is what we have uh, going on in our life and ministry together. So excited about what God has in store for us in worship this morning. Uh, Would you bow with me as we go to God together in prayer? Let us pray. Gracious God, what a gift it is to be able to gather together as your people here in this space at this time to worship you. Lord, I bring you uh, my whole heart and my whole self to you this day and And we do that as a people, as your people, offering nothing less than our very all. So we ask God that you would be present with us now by the power of your spirit. We pray that you would move powerfully in our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To give God praise with whatever posture you want to connect with him with. But we're going to raise up our praise this morning. Let's give it everything that we have. Let's lift up our hallelujah. Praise God. Praise you, Yahweh. Jesus, we praise. Let's sing this out as a body, as a church together. We raise our hallelujah. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Hallelujah, louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive 
us in this moment to just rid ourselves of distraction away from the noise and just worship him it's our calling it's our eternal calling to worship him to give him glory and praise he's worthy
a living sacrifice which is holy and acceptable to God.
for those that the line in the song is true. It's been a while, but hear my heart's cry again. Your heavenly Father is not mad that it's been a while. He just can't wait to talk again. So God, even now, maybe this is that first time in a while that we're here to meet with you. God, meet with us now. Through the power of your word, by your Holy Spirit's presence, by the, the blood of Jesus that covers us and washes us white as snow, we meet with you, God. Have our whole attention. This we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. This time the kids are uh, dismissed to head back to Cove Kids. And those that are online, uh, Miss Patricia has Cove Kids online uh, ready for you as we all, all together Go dig into God's word as we will do the same here in this room. I uh, do want to pause for a moment uh, before we turn to the word and, and offer a word of celebration and of thanksgiving. Last week was Commitment Sunday at Covenant, and uh, it, it kind of kicked off the time in which we received pledges to next year's ministry uh, budget. And we received a wonderful outpouring that, that is an incredible start. Uh, we had 16 new families uh, make a first-time pledge to the church. What a, what a glorious uh, gift that is, especially in, in, in the conclusion of 2020, uh, to have 16 that have come into the community of faith in that way. What a, what a gift that is. Also, uh, of those that were renewing their pledge, 41% of those increased their pledge year over year as we each are... are intentionally uh, striving after uh, that, that holy calling of tithing, and uh, through the pledge increases, I know that, that that pursuit is ongoing for so many families. I praise God for that. Uh, we continue to receive these pledges over the course of the next few weeks as our finance team will, uh, will close their work on the budget on February 28th. So over the course of the next two weeks, uh, we'll continue to receive those and, and be in the process of follow-up. If you're a member and you haven't renewed your pledge uh, uh, or you haven't made a pledge to the church, you could do so uh, uh, through covenantconnects.life on the give page. There's a make your pledge option. Also, there are physical cards as well here in the space. You can put them in an envelope, leave them in the offering plate on your way out. We would love to count you in the number as we, again, uh, pursue as a congregation uh, that high holy calling of the whole body, 100% of the members of the church, uh, making a pledge to the ministry with Sharon. Uh, this morning, we're going to dig into God's word uh, through Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. If you have your Bibles, I hope that you'll turn with me there as we'll uh, walk our way through the text, hearing uh, this holy calling of God for, uh, for the people of God as they are preparing to enter into that God's promise. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 12. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can follow along with the words on the screen as we together, the people of God, hear the word of the Lord. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children and their children after them, may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as a symbol on your hands. 
and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on, your door, on the door frames of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Wells that you did not dig. And vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. This is God's word offered to us in its reading and indeed in its hearing. So we give thanks together as the people of God for his word. Will you bow with me for a word of prayer? Gracious God, you are astounding and wondrous. And your word uh, inspires and compels and convicts. And so we gather around your word and we ask, oh God, that you would open our eyes. That we would see you more clearly. Open our ears that we would hear what you have for us this day. Open our minds that would come to know and understand your word in a new and fresh way. Our hearts that we would feel its power in our lives. And then, oh God, we ask that you would open our hands. That we would then offer grace to the world. We pray this as the people of God in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, I was out and about a lot yesterday, and I feel like maybe you were too. If you were in Walmart, H-E-B, Kroger, Home Depot, or Lowe's yesterday, raise your hand. That's about what I expected. Uh, 75% plus of those in the room were out yesterday. Something about weather, I heard. Like, they're, like uh, we all opened our phone yesterday morning. We touched the little weather button, and the weather said Monday low 7 degrees. <laughs> now, now, since then, obviously, the meteorologists have backed off. You know, they've doubled it to 14, so we could all breathe a huge sigh of relief. It's only going to be a Texas 14-degree Monday. Uh but we, we saw that in our phones, and we all thought, oh, we should probably prepare, uh, because we are not prepared. Some of you are from further up north, and this is your first winter in Texas. Welcome to Texas. You wonder why we are not prepared, because this doesn't happen often. Uh, it just doesn't. I mean, we could remember together when it has happened. I remember in... 93, 94, there was an ice storm, crazy ice storm that came through South Texas, knocked power out all across the South. Uh, all the trees were weighted down with ice and just snapped power lines, snapped power poles, snapped. It was, it was, it was crazy. And it wasn't snow. It wasn't, be- well, it was kind of beautiful. It was beautiful in a, an odd sort of a way. But like, we didn't go out and make snow angels or make snowmen. We went and we kicked fences, like chain link fences, to see how much ice we could knock off of them. Like we, we went and, and we found gutters where like huge icicles were and we knocked them off and we licked them because we were intelligent. Uh, this is what Texas, I mean, we remember these things because it doesn't happen often. We remember, uh, it, what was it, 2004 or something like that when Galveston had snow on Christmas Y'all remember that? I wasn't in Galveston, but I was in Dallas, and I was watching, uh, I was watching the, the, the news feed of Galveston like, no way, absolutely, snowmen on the beach in Galveston. We remember because it's a, a rare occurrence. It, it's, it's shocking or surprising. So I hope that all of you, if we do indeed get five to eight inches of snow tonight, which seems like another mistake by the meteorologist but we shall see if we do i hope that you'll make memories tomorrow because so much about life is what we remember those treasured experiences that we carry with us from season to season from year to year across the course of life and what we forget also matters as well 
there's a, a clear threat for us, the people of God, uh, articulated by God in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 12. It is at the very end of what we read, and, and it, it should startle us and catch our attention, awaken us to maybe pay more attention to what preceded it because of how grave this threat really is. It says, be careful, you people of God, that you do not forget the Lord. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord. And some of you might initially have a visceral response to that, something kind of twisting in your gut that that says, how could that happen? I can't forget the Lord. The Lord is a part of who I am. The Lord is working in me and through me by the power of the Spirit. The, The Lord is present in my life in such a profound way. How could I forget the Lord? If it wasn't a necessary uh, uh, caution that the Lord would give us, it wouldn't be accounted in Scripture. But it is. It's clear. Don't forget the Lord. I mean, that's an that's a, that's a intentional pursuit that seems to be required for us there. Like, like we're, we're, we're to, to drive after our relationship with God with such intentional focus that we would not forget. Because we do forget things. We forget things all the time. We forget to, to call our mom and tell her we love her. And when we finally do, we realize how long it's been. And we wonder how we could have forgotten. That doesn't seem to make any sense or to be reasonable at all. And yet it happens. We forget our keys and our wallets, our phones. We forget our, our, our anniversaries, except for the men. None of the men here have ever forgotten an anniversary. We, we We forget uh, important occasions, we're reminded of them, and all of a sudden it comes back to a heightened sense of importance for us. And we begin to question, how did we ever forget in the first place? Be careful that you don't forget the Lord. Well, this... This text, particularly verse 4 and following through verse 5, is known in the Jewish tradition as the Shema. This is a key ordinance decree that that is carried with the people of God as that reminder, this, this thing that will help us to remember and actually what it is we are to remember We're coming out of the chapter where where God has provided the Ten Commandments to the people of God. And out of the commandments, now we have these two decrees. Two decrees that are to be remembered. It it begins in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In, In other words, there is only one God. And He is our God. There there is no other. And and now you can start to to understand why this might be something that we forget. Because we can relate to the fact that all too often we seem to acknowledge or, or to live as though there are other gods than the one and only God. And it's described in this text what the people of God might might experience when they enter into God's promise. When they enter into God's bounty as they cross the river Jordan and enter into the promised land. In verse 10 and following it lays out, hey, you're going to move into flourishing cities. You didn't build them. You're going to live in houses full of awesome stuff that you didn't provide. You're going to drink from wells that you didn't dig. You're going to eat from groves and vineyards that you did not plant. And then here's what's going to happen. You're going to eat and you're going to be satisfied. And you're going to think that you have all this awesome stuff. And you're going to think you did something. And maybe by horrific chance you begin to consider yourself as God. Alongside of or over and above the one true God. 
at first blush, when reading verse 4 of the Shema, we wonder why is this even necessary to declare, obviously, we believe that there is one God, three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit. There is one God, one alone. But yet we require reminding and we must remember it with such intentional ferocity that we would never allow any other idol to come up alongside of or in place of God. The second decree that is given in the Shema is in verse 5, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. Love God. If God is one, if there is only one God and he is your God, obviously you should love him. Obviously we should offer our whole selves to God, and not just a part or a portion, but all, 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 three times stated, all heart, all soul, all strength. And for many of us, the, the, the heart part and the strength part seems to resonate because we could get that. We, we, we might have had a human experience of love uh, where we gave our whole heart to someone, where we can experience vulnerability, where we can experience heartbreak, where we can pour our, our whole emotional self into into a relationship, and that sort of heart, love, can be reflected upon such that we can understand what it means to love God with our whole heart, our whole strength, all of our strength, that that we would give all of our energy, uh, that that we would produce, that we would provide, that we would care for uh, with such intentionality that, that that loving relationship would be preserved and honored in an intentional way. That Those are things that we more commonly are able to relate to, loving with heart, loving with strength. So I want to pause a moment and be sure that we take account for what it means to love God with our whole, with all of our soul. A few years ago, I began asking a question amongst the people of Covenant. Uh, some of you have heard me ask this question in, in meetings or in gatherings of, of, of small groups. And the, I remember the first time I asked this question, I, I, I had to have that disciplined, quiet uh, teacher moment, right? Sometimes as a teacher, it's not just when you speak, but it's when you don't speak, right? So I, I dropped the question, how is it with your soul? And I paused. And then I restated, how is it with your soul? And I waited. And sometimes it's in that space of waiting that we can best understand what it means to love God with all of our soul. How is it with your soul? And when you wait long enough for all of the ancillary distractions of life to fade away, how is it with your soul? And you let all of the things to do and the work to account for to fall into a faded backdrop. How is it with your soul? And you create space for all of the posturing and bravado, the fake accounts for what life is or the way you're presenting it to be get peeled away. You can find that tender space soul the authentic god image within each and every one of us that is so deeply connected with who god is we could say i am devoting my entire spiritual being to God 
without any distraction or any diversion, simply devoted to God. So now maybe we can sit back and hear this again. There is only one God, God alone, that is it. Decree number one. Number two, ordinance, command. Love that God. Love that God with all that you are and all that you have, with your whole heart, with your whole strength, and also with all of your soul so that your whole being is poured out to God day by day, moment by moment, fully and intentionally connected and devoted to God. This is our pursuit. This is what we are called to do. And, and there's even a, a so that, there's, there's a purpose, there's an outcome that is being driven towards and, and it's lined out for us in what precedes the Shema. Beginning in verse 2, God says, hey, I'm giving you these commands, I'm giving you these ordinances, both the Ten Commandments and, uh, and the Shema. I'm providing these for you for a purpose, verse 2, so that you, your children, children after them may. So, so, so generations, so the people of God, all of us will, so that we will. Fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping his decrees and commands. I'm giving you these things for the purpose, for the intentional reason of, of creating space for you, for us to fear God by obedience. There, there, there are more words kind of covering that sentence, but if we were to narrow it down and drop the clauses and just get to the, to the core meat of the matter, this is so that we would fear God by obedience. And, and I, I think that fear is, is a, key, uh, a, a key element of what it means to have reverence for God. And in a couple of weeks, I'm really excited about a passage that the Lord has led us to as we enter into a Lenten series uh, we're talking about what Christ calls us to, to fear God, not only fear God, but to fear Christ, which we oftentimes uh, lack a fear of. And he talks about why and what that means. And so we're going to dig into that more in a couple of weeks. But you could hear in this text that the purpose of the provision of laws and ordinance isn't just so God can have some some control or some domination uh, over his people, but it's so that we would have a fearful relationship with God, one that has reverence and honor such that we would be moved into a posture of obedience. And then what happens? You've heard me say this before, people of God, that, that whenever you see the words so that in Scripture, underline them, circle them, highlight them, like it should startle you just enough so that you will dig a little bit deeper and take those next few steps into the text. The end of verse, uh, verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3 orient two more layers to that. Uh, this is all so that you, you want to fear God in obedience so that you will enjoy a long life. So that you will enjoy a long life. And, hero Israel, be careful to obey. A restating of what was previously said. Fear in obedience. So now, be obedient. In verse 3, it continues. So that you will enjoy a long life and it will go well with you and you may increase greatly. These are the three natural outcomes of what it means to Fear the Lord in obedience by declaring that he is God alone, living as such, and loving God with your whole heart, that you would enjoy a long life, it will go well with you, and you will increase greatly. As, as Zachary has, Pastor Zach has stated this, by the way, sometimes I call him Zachary, sometimes I call him Zacharias, some, I just make up like roots of Zach. Uh, in meetings, so I, I don't even know what his real name is. I don't know if it's anything other than Zach, but uh, he has named this sermon Live Long and Prosper. And he points to the promise of God that we will enjoy a long life, that it will go well with us, and we will increase greatly through fearful obedience to God's decrees, commands, and ordinances. But we have to be careful 
to not forget the Lord. It is so easy to forget. I mean, think about uh, your time back in, 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 in your school years or, or maybe uh, even uh, some, some different uh, uh, assignments that you've had in your work life where you've had to remember certain things. And, and I don't know about you, but I always have, have attempted to find some sort of like word association or some sort of song or some sort of like rhythm to be able to appropriate so that I could remember some things. I, I work with my kids as they're memorizing their spelling for their spelling test or as they're working through different uh, math equations. You know, you get the formulas and you got to remember the formulas. I'm, I'm not talking about the, the teachers that just like post them on the wall. So it's like cheating. All the kids can just look on the wall and they have the formulas. I'm talking about like the teachers that require you to remember the formulas. You know the quadratic equation. X equals minus B plus and minus a square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. I almost got that right, I think. Yeah, oh, good. I got a teacher thumbs up. So, um, so like, like all of those sorts of tools are there for, for a purpose, so that you would remember. And I love what God does for us here. God doesn't uh, give us the, 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 the purpose of, of the ordinance, decree, and command. He doesn't just give us the decree and the command, but he then says, I want you to remember this. I don't want you to forget me. I want you to be intentional about this, and I'm going to give you don't forget tools. So we're going to dig in just for a couple of moments about in the don't forget tools. Are you ready? So this is in verse 6, 7, 8, and 9. These commands I give you today are to be on your hearts. So I want you to feel how important they are. And after you do that, here are the three kind of classifications of the don't forget tools. Number one, talk about it. Talk about God being God and talk about your love for God, your loving relationship with God, the ways you experience God's love and the way that you offer God love. Talk about it. It says, talk about it in these ways. Talk about it with your kids. Talk about it when you're sitting around at home. Talk about it when you are laying down. And when you're getting up, talk about God. I mean, this, is, this seems kind of simple. The more you talk about something, the more you're actually likely to do it. It's like that, that classic tool that the, the guy decides he's going to go run a marathon. What's the first thing you do whenever you sign up for a marathon? You tell people about it because if you tell people about it, you're more likely to actually go and run the marathon. If you don't tell anyone, then by the time it gets to marathon time, you're going to back out because no one ever knew anyway, so it didn't even matter, right? Uh, That's what happens. If you want to be doing something, you talk about it. How often do we talk to our kids about God? I mean, I know that that we just sent our kids so that Patricia can talk to them about God. Like, that's good. We've just outsourced the issue. We've like said, okay, you take care of my kids' Christianity. How often do we talk to our kids about God? I know we talk to them about how they're doing in school. Are Are they being respectful to their teachers? Who'd you play with on the playground? We talk to our kids when they get older about who they're interested in, what, what guys and girls they have their eyes for, right? We, we talk to them about who they hung out with, what they're doing. Are you doing anything you don't need to be doing? Like, we talk to them about these things, but do we talk to them about God? Maybe that's a good starting point. It's tool number one that God gives us. Talk about him to others. I mean, it, when you sit at home, I mean, you got your spot at home. Like everybody has like their, their, their spot, like their chair or their couch, like the little nook in the couch that fits just you and no one dare sit there because they know that that's your spot. Or, or maybe when you, when you get at the dinner table, everybody has a seat. This is, where, this is where Addie sits. This is where Aiden sits. This is where Sam sits. This is where Mom sits. This is where Dad sits. We all have our seats and you dare not sit there. What, what if when, when you sit in those spots, what are you doing? You're eating. You're watching TV. You're vegging. You're on your phone. Right? Like you're doing your thing. What if instead you talked about God when you're sitting there? When you lay down, when you you rise, last thing you talk about before you go to bed, first thing you talk about in the morning. Some of y'all are like, I don't talk about anything in the morning. I need need 30 minutes and three cups of coffee before I talk. Well, maybe you only need to utter just a few words. I love you, God. And that could be the reminder you need for the day. So number one, 
Don't forget tool, talk about God. Talk about your love for God. Talk about God's love for you. Talk about it. Number two. Number two is to give yourself personal reminders, right? Uh, it's, it's the sticky note principle. Uh, have you seen someone that, that knows that they're going to brush the teeth in the morning and they put a sticky note on the mirror so that they don't forget that? Maybe you've gotten one of those little white erase markers and, and, and you've had your kid or, or you've uh, written a Bible verse or a reminder for the day and you put it up there. How can we give personal reminders for ourselves? The two personal reminders that God establishes for the people of Israel is, is, to, is, to, uh, is on your hand. Uh, tie a symbol on your hand and bind it on your forehead. You'll maybe remember seeing an Orthodox Jew that has a box that is strapped or tied to their head or around their hat on the front. In that is contained the Shema so that they would remember it. And every time they see themselves in the mirror, that reflection, they remember that. It's a personal reminder. What personal reminders do you have or could you have? Do you wear a cross on a necklace so every time you see an image of yourself, you're reminded of the sacrifice we have in our Savior Jesus Christ? I have friends that have found that tied on your hand and they've put symbols of crosses or the word grace or an igthus of some sort on their wrist, taking very seriously what it means to have a personal reminder. What are your personal reminders? Some of you carry a, a cross in your pocket that you could pull out or in a meeting you could put your hand in your pocket and you can be reminded that God is in control. Jesus still saves. Personal reminders. Are critical. God has established it as a way in which we can stay connected with him, a way in which we can fear and obey and live out these two ordinances to establish that God is one and that our love is his. The third tool, the don't forget tool that God establishes is maybe a little more difficult for us, something that we do a little less often. It's, it's have a testimony of sorts out in the world. That there are three ways that this happens. The first is back in the talk about it section. Most of the talk about it that we just, that we just uh, kind of laid out was all like in your home, in your family, in your kind of in your setting, in your personal setting. But then one, one thing that's inserted there is to talk about it when you walk along the road, like when you're out and about, when you're, when you're in the aisle at HEB, talk about God. When, when, you, when, you are, uh, when you're sitting down at a restaurant and hanging out with a waiter or waitress for a second, talk about God. What is it to, to have that personal testimony? So when you're out and about, when you're going about your daily lives, you would talk about God. It also kind of lays out this, this presentation to the world in verse uh, 9. It says, write them, write these ordinances, write this fact that God is your God, God alone, and that you will love him. Write it on your door frames, the door frames of your houses, and write it on your gates. Some of us will get that internal door frame reference and, and we put crosses up in our homes or pictures of our baptisms on our, uh, in, in, our, in our collages of our pictures. There are ways in which we acknowledge our faith there in our homes. But what would it also be to have that outward facing presence right on your gates? How do we live that out today? where we could present to everyone that would see us or come in contact with us that we are devoted to God, to God alone. These are the three don't forget me principles from God. Tools. Talk about your relationship with God. Have personal reminders set up and have that personal kind of outward facing testimony to the world. But I hear again verse 12, and it just wrecks me that God feels, has the need to say, be careful to not forget me. I've walked with so many of you over the course of these last years as you have had parents who've experienced dementia of one form or another and you've journeyed with parents or grandparents who have no longer had the cognitive capacity to remember so much of their life of who they are and where they are I remember when I was pastoring in Bryan College Station a couple Holly and Betty Reese Holly had been caring for his wife Betty when I arrived in Bryan Texas for seven years and by the time I moved it was 12 years he cared for her when she had severe Alzheimer's I remember going to his house in that 12th year and Holly reminded me as though I needed reminding because I had visited him very very often he reminded me he said 
you know, Betty, she might not know who I am or who you are or where we are in this moment at this time, but she, she will never forget the Lord. And so there in those spaces, those tender moments, the three of us together would sing Amazing Grace. She didn't remember her husband's name, but she knew that God's grace is amazing. And we would recite the Lord's Prayer. And she still knew the words of the Lord's Prayer because they had been written on her heart. And we would profess the faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. There's something about those tender spaces of connection that runs so deep. May it be so for you and for me, for all of us, that we would never forget the Lord our God, who we love. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, loving God, God of all power and might, of wonder and majesty, you are worthy of our honor and praise. We worship you, O God, who was and is and is to come. Lord, we join with the the chorus of the heavenly host in declaring your praise and acknowledging your majesty. And we pray, O God, in this space and time that that we would be so bound up with your Holy Spirit that we would never forget you, that we would honor you all our days, this day and every day that follows, for you are God and we are not, and you are worthy of our love and praise. We lift all these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. Three.
Today is Scout Sunday, and so we have a familiar face that is going to help in leading us in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with God and with one another. So I'm going to invite us into a moment of pause as we meet with the Lord in silence, confessing our sin and offering our hearts to him. Would you bow with me? Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. There is so much that we, the people of God, can be thankful for. And so when we come to this great thanksgiving, we, we remember all of the many blessings that we've received from God. His provision, His love, His mercy, and His grace. Above all else, we thank our God for His love expressed in Jesus Christ, His only Son, who He gave for us that we might have eternity with Him. And so we give thanks to God for Jesus. And we remember that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, the night he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and he broke the bread. And he turned to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do so in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks to you. And he turned to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. So we ask of God that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these, your gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your spirit, O God. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, both now and forevermore. Amen. And now let us join together as we're led once more in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Together, we'll receive the sacrament of Holy Communion by, by approaching. The ushers will direct you as individuals and families to come uh, to, to one of the, the stations. Uh, if you would like to receive gluten-free, just acknowledge it to the server, and we have gluten-free here as well. If you come with your hands held open, you'll receive a cup. In the cup is both the wafer and the juice by twisting the peel top twice, the first for the wafer, the second for the juice. If, uh, if you would like, I hope that you'll take some time to meet with the Lord at the kneelers in prayer. This is not Covenant's table. It's not a Methodist table. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. As such, all has been prepared and all are welcome to come. He has invited you, me, all of us to come. Let us come.
Brothers and sisters, would you be seated for just a moment? Today is a special day in the life of the church. It's what we at Covenant call a welcome Sunday. We have some families that have been meeting with Pastor Zach and are prepared to join with the church and become members. Uh, if you would, if you're prepared to join the church, would you stand at this time? We welcome the Rodriguez family, the Botterford family. We're so excited to, to have them as a part of this family of faith. Uh, would the members of the church stand alongside of them at this time as well as we again commit ourselves to the work of, of ministry and the faith that, that God has called us to? Brothers and sisters, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you uh, accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord? I do. do you wish to join covenant in our efforts to create a community connecting in Christ? I do. And lastly, will you develop your witness as you worship, connect, and serve, and commit your prayers and your pledge to the ministry of covenant? Uh, wonderful. Would you welcome these two families to the life and ministry of the church? And I invite you all to stand and join together as we receive this benediction. Would you stand at this time? Lord, we go forth from this place confident in the love we have in your son, Jesus Christ. Thankful for the gift that we have. You are one true God. So now we go remembering that love, remembering who you are. Everywhere we go, every day, Lord, bless and keep us this week and watch over us as we go into the world to proclaim your good news. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters.